Good afternoon. My name is Aki Oshutoki. I'm the chairman programs committee at the Nigerian British Honor to welcome you to another webinar in our sharing experiences series. Our theme this afternoon is building a brand, building a brand. Our guest is an outstanding achiever, founder and chairman, Zenith Bank PLC, and author, Africa, Rise and Shine. Before I go too far, shall we have the national anthem of Nigeria followed by the national anthem of Britain? share a few of the webinar guidelines with you. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on to comment and have discussions, please use the chat icon. Kindly submit your questions the Q and A icon, Q and A shall be attended to. Now it is time to invite Mr. Kayode Fallow, President and Chairman of Council to give his welcome address. Mr. Fallow. Thank you very much, Aki Oshutoki. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Council of the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second edition of the Sharing Experiences series of the Chamber. Today, we have the honor of hosting the man regarded as the father of modern day banking in Nigeria as our guest speaker. In addition, we have in attendance several eminent personalities from the private and public sectors. And with your permission, I wish to recognize the presence 
of a few of them. I welcome a great supporter of the activities of the NBCC and chairman of the Honeywell Group, Oba Otudeko. I also welcome former Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos, Professor Ibida Obe. The President and Chairman of Council of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, Mr. Abimbola Obubanjo. Managing Director, CEO of Zenith Bank, Beniza Oyeagu, and the MD CEO of the Export Promotion Council, Mr. Shebwa Olo. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to also recognize the presence of some of our past presidents on this call. I welcome Ashiwaju Olawale Kool, Architect T.C. Awagu, Prince Adeyemi Adefulu, and Prince Adedako Adelego. The protocol list will not be complete without recognizing the presence of the sponsors of this event. I therefore welcome and thank the management of Zenith Bank PLC, ably led by the CEO, Ebenezer Onyeagu, and the Deputy MD, Adaura Uwoto. We appreciate your kind and generous support. We thank and also welcome our other sponsors, Prudential Zenith Life Insurance Company, Ernst & Young, Cyberspace, and X3M Ideas. The MBCC Sharing Experiences Series is a signature event of the Chamber, which was instituted a few months ago. We had the pleasure of having Haikuje Haiki Mokwede for the first edition, and today we have the pleasure of having Mr. Jim Ovea. The series is designed to provide a platform for the world to learn from the experience of exemplary leaders and achievers in the organized private sector. The program enables these great men and women to share their stories of entrepreneurship, dream actualization, innovativeness, and brand building. Having the caliber of today's guest speaker is a great opportunity for learning and self-development for all of us. And I am convinced that we shall all realize lifelong benefits from being present at today's event. The Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce is a bilateral organization whose main objective is to foster goodwill and enhance trade and investment flows between Nigeria and the United Kingdom. The Chamber was founded 43 years ago and currently has 300 top corporate organizations in Nigeria and the UK as its members. A visit to our website will show that a large number of the leading businesses and brands in Nigeria are indeed members of the Chamber. The NBCC has four categories of membership. And I am particularly pleased to mention and recognize the companies in our elite class. These are the premium members of the chambers whose support over the years has been of immense benefit to us. They include Standard Chartered Bank, BAPLC, PWC, Access Bank PLC, British Airways, Custodian and Allied Insurance, Fidelity Bank PLC, UTL Trustees Limited, Seplat Petroleum Development Company, and Wilmer Bank. The Chamber is an affiliate of the British Chamber of Commerce, which gives our members access to a network of 53 chambers across the United Kingdom and 49 affiliate chambers worldwide. I wish to encourage those who are yet to join us to please undergo our application screening process and thereafter take the benefits of being members of the chamber. In processing, in proceeding, I wish to thank the chairman of our programs committee, Akio Shutoki, 
the committee members and a very efficient secretariat for putting together this sharing experience event. At the last count, 696 people have registered for the program. And I must say, Mr. Ovia, that you have broken the chart. This is the highest number we have recorded in our virtual programs. The event will be moderated by one of us, the Managing Director of DCSL Corporate Services Limited, and one of our Deputy Presidents in the Chamber, BC Adeyemi. I welcome you, BC, and trust that you will do a great job in our usual tradition. Our guest speaker is the founder, pioneer managing director, and chairman of Zenith Bank PLC, one of the largest financial institutions in Nigeria, and the sixth largest commercial bank in Africa. Zenith Bank has a total asset base of 17 billion US dollars and a shareholders fund of 2.5 billion US dollars. It is the biggest Nigerian bank by tier one capital. Mr. Ovia is an accomplished entrepreneur, a motivational speaker and writer. He authored the highly rated Forbes published book, Africa Rise and Shine, which details the secrets of the rise of Zenith Bank PLC to the top of the Nigerian and indeed the African financial sector. Following the deregulation of the banking sector in the late 1980s, Mr. Ovea, along with some investors, founded Zenith Bank in May 1990. He led the institution for a solid 20 years and transformed it into a financial services conglomerate while building an iconic identity for the bank. Zenith Bank became listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange on October 21st, 2004, and became the first Nigerian bank to be licensed by the UK Financial Services Authority in March 2007. The bank was named Bank of the Year at the 2019 Business Day Awards and has remained the most valuable banking brand in Nigeria for three consecutive years. It is for the foregoing and other numerous achievements of Mr. Jim Ovia that we have invited him to share his rich experience with Nigerians and other attendees from the UK and other parts of the world. Mr. Ovia is an alumnus of the Harvard Business School, the University of Louisiana, and the Southern University of Louisiana, all in the USA. He is a member of the World Economic Forum Community of Chairpersons and co-chair of the World Economic Forum's African Regional Business Council. He is a quiet but extremely extremely generous philanthropist. And the Gmovia Foundation has granted scholarships to a large number of Nigerian university students. The foundation has also funded over 40% of the pupils of James Hope College in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2008 CEO of the Year Award winner, a Lifetime Achievement Winner of the African Banker Awards 2015, and a Commander of the Order of the Niger, Mr. Jim Ovia. I wish to thank you for your audience and here now invite Mr. Ovia to give his address. Thank you. Hello, let me wish you all a very special good morning, good afternoon. And um, for some of you who are logging in uh, from continental USA, Canada, I will say very special good morning. I know the time there should be about seven in the morning 
or between three and seven, depending on which part of uh, the US you're logging in from. Those who are logging in from West Africa, Africa generally, we know is already in the afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. And those who are logging in from Asia, China, and other parts of the world, I'll probably say good evening because it's a special evening. Now, the topic chosen by the Nigerian British Changer of Commerce, that's their topic, is building a brand. I would like to modify that a little bit to say building a brand through innovation, particularly during this period of COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we all need to be very creative, very innovative to be able to carry on with our businesses um, in line with the new normal. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking uh, members of the board, the executives of Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce for inviting me. Um, I will call this more of peer-to-peer -peer conversation because we are all peers actually. And even though it's also called experience sharing, we say peer-to-peer, -peer, more like uh, David Rubinstein's program on Bloomberg. So when we have Q&A session, that I'm looking forward to that, we will also enjoy that. That will be the typical peer-to-peer -peer co uh, conversation. Branding, what is really a brand? What does it really matter whether you have a good brand or you don't? Or whether institutions brand matter or not? It matters greatly. The practical definition of brand or branding I'm going to present to you is the one of Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, I picked him because he's an outstanding entrepreneur. Uh, we all know him, we use his product, we use his services, online businesses. He's the CEO of Amazon. Jeff Bezos said, a brand for a company is like reputation for a person. A brand for a company is like reputation for a person. So now, who is Jeff Bezos to tell us that? He's a well-renowned, very successful, in fact, he's currently the richest man in the world. So which example can I also present to you? Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world today, over 150 billion US dollars rich. That's after gifting to his wife $50 billion. He still remains the richest man in the world. So we will listen to his definition. Now, that is what he thinks a brand is. Brand is integrity, is reputation, both for a company, a corporate organization, a nation, and the services being offered, product, and also for individuals. That is branding. Now, having given an example of a reputable individual and highly successful individual to give us the definition of a Kickstarter of brand and branding. Let's also go to the public sector and let's see how they define, how they look at branding. Now, no other person but Lee Kuan Yew, late of Singapore, how he built Singapore from a third world to a first world country or economy. For what Lee Kuan Yew had done for Singapore, there's no doubt he knows what branding is. He knows how to build a brand, how he built a third world economy to a first world, then definitely he knows. He's always talking about reputation and integrity. And you could see that in his book, from the third world to the first. That was the story of Singapore. Particularly at the time he decided he had to create a financial center out of a small island of less than 6 million people, hinterland, they had no known well countries 
on their border line that they could really emulate. And they had just been separated by the British from Malaysia. So they had nothing. It was like a dreamer thinking about building a financial center after Singapore, but he did. And the reputation was such that the standard was so high, the integrity was so high, his ministers must emulate his integrity. And a very good example was, if we all remember, a bank, um, an Asian bank called BCCI. Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore at that time was the only prime minister to refuse to license BCCI. After BCCI had been licensed in many European countries, many Asian countries, and of course, we know in many African countries, what did he notice about BCCI management and ownership structure? Is there in his book. I'm not here to sell his book, but at the same time, he was right. A few years later, in 1991, BCCI failed. They lost about 11 billion depositors' money. Singapore came out clean, unscratched, because he's the only one that could tell BCI should not be licensed as a bank. So that shows the kind of branding or brand that Lee Kuan Yew wants us to emulate, the Lee Kuan Yew brand for an individual, or if you will, um, the business brand, Amazon.com brand. So having said that, how do we build a brand through innovation and creativity? In many ways, the very highly successful companies in the world, their brands were built through innovation. Amazon is one of them. The kind of things that Amazon does today, if they were not innovating, they wouldn't be able to do that. Despite the pandemic, the stock price of Amazon continued to rise, whereas many institutions are falling by the wayside, blaming pandemic. But now you have to stay at home, you shop online, do many things online. That due to the innovation and creativity of Jeff Bezos. Then you go further than that. What else can you discover or learn through innovation and, and creativity of building a brand? Now, let's look at companies that have done extremely poorly and those that have done and produced superior quality results. Let's go back to a very good example we all know. We know about Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica example is always my very favorite story. I recall when we all were little boys, when you visit parents' home of your friend who just came back from the UK, the first thing you notice that they have they would have decorated their living room with Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica, they have it from wall to wall, very beautiful copies. Those were very good furniture in those days. And it's also a way to know some parents that schooled abroad at that time, if they came back home with Encyclopedia Britannica. However, after some years, then we now have innovation, innovation to change all that. There was CD-ROM, where Encarta in a CD-ROM is enough to have all the information in the Cyclopedia Britannica. CD-ROM then, CD, compare this ROM, read only memory at that time. For us, we used to be very excited in the early 90s, very excited to buy a software of Microsoft software, Windows software, that Windows 95, some of the early uh, precursors of Windows uh, Me. 
Windows Millennium. We, of course, we know Windows Millennium was in 2000. When you buy a copy, then you will be lucky to have a copy of CD-ROM and Kata. The Encarta is actually had all information. One CD-ROM of Encarta had all information of Encyclopedia Britannica. Therefore, Encyclopedia Britannica was worth nothing at that time. And I don't think any parents, any home ever displays Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. Of course not. That's simply because it's absolutely unnecessary, completely unnecessary. You have this in CD-ROM, your laptop, and you even download them. Now, they don't even hand it over to you anymore in CD-ROM. It's already in software. It's already downloaded in your PC. You buy any of the pieces uh, that you already have um, the software already downloaded. So that was how Encyclopedia Britannica perished because they didn't innovate. They did not innovate. So you cannot see how innovation led to the, the demise of Encyclopedia Britannica. Then we can also give and see one or two other examples. We all remember the Walkman, the music Walkman. You never have it strapped on your waist when you walk around or ride in a car or your bicycle. You listen to the music. Um, after a while, the music stopped. You then stop and rewind the Walkman. But the company that produced the Walkman at that time, I think they were Kodak, Sony, they are still in business, but they do not sell Walkman anymore. The reason was simple. There was a new technology, the predecessor, precursor of iPhone, and that was iPod by Apple. They came up with iPod that could hold a thousand, two thousand music just for the price of next to nothing. All you need to buy is iPod. That is a great deal of innovation. Of course, we all know the brand value of Apple. Apple today, the market cap is worth over half a trillion US dollar, over 500 billion. 500 billion is more than the GDP of Nigeria. That is one company due to their creativity due to their innovation. And of course, do they have a good brand? I bet you. Apple has, is one of the top 10 uh, most valuable brands in the world. And of course, we also know that um, Amazon is also one of the top 10 most valuable brands in the world. Success goes with branding, or brand goes with success. Very successful organizations in the world always have some of the highest brands. And also, very successful economies in the world also goes with some of the highest brands. Now, we can also give one or two examples. We remember Kodak, the instant photography. And Kodak camera was like, you know, you have to buy it for your kids, you have to buy it for your family members, and all that. But now, no one buys instant camera anymore because it's there in your iPhone, the camera is there, you store it in your software. Those are the innovations that help to build brand. And the organizations that develop those innovative ideas and products and services, we all know who they are today. Apple again is one of the most famous brands. So branding goes with success. Successful stories of various products and services. That is the definition of branding. Then what else do we talk about when you are looking at branding? Let's spend more time to talk about innovation. Innovation, innovation, because it's exactly what makes you develop some of the best brands you can think of. One, 
let's look at the current global crisis we are all experiencing, the pandemic, COVID-19. How do we adjust to COVID-19 situation all over the world? Different countries, they are coming up with some innovative ways of how to survive. Some are trying to develop vaccine, some are waiting in the wings. But at the same time, when different countries start to do their testing, a lot of resources are required. Even here in Nigeria, I'm very impressed to note, and I have to announce here, that there is a company, a small company, not too big, called Flying Doctors. I was so impressed that they had built some mobile testing units in about 10 states in the country. 10 states, small mobile testing units. And they've been listed in World Health Organization as some of the most unique tools that can be used for mobile um, uh, COVID testing. And I was impressed. That is innovation and that is creativity. And definitely we'll be able to recognize and respect the ingenuity of such organization. That's what adversity teaches us. Adversity will always teach us how to adapt to a very difficult situation, how to innovate and how to be very creative to be able to survive. It's no longer the survival of the fittest in terms of strength and energy. But now, in this world of COVID, it's more of survival of the most creative, the most adaptive. So you have to adapt to the situation that you find yourself. Hence, everyone is always talking about the new normal. How does brand got to do with this? Yes, the very successful ones, their brand will always be recognized. Now, we're also going to go further down to go and discuss other corporate entities that have done remarkably well. We had mentioned some organizations in the US, in the UK that have done remarkably well. We mentioned um, Amazon, we mentioned Apple. In Africa, there are also some great companies too. Some of the best brands, and you can swear by their name too, they also permeate their services all over Africa. MTN is listed as some of the best brands in Africa. Dangote is listed as one of the best brands in Africa. Mind you, this list was compiled by Fox. These are not my personal list. I'm very happy that those lists have been compiled. I also endorse them personally. And even though some of the owners of those institutions are my personal friend, but I'm very proud of them and I congratulate them. MTN, Glow, Dangote, these are some of the best brands in Nigeria today or in Africa, if you will. Why are they regarded as great brands? Because they offer the services and you can trust by their services. You, they have integrity. That is brand. They have reputation. That is brand. So I'm sure one of the highly rated mobile companies in Africa today is MTN and Glow. So they will have some of the most recognizable brands, not just by their advert alone, but by the services they offer. You will recognize them by that. You will trust them by that. They have integrity. Now, if you know that you're going to build um, houses, structures, and all that, you can build them without dangote cement, and so on. And so on. I'm not advertising for them. These are actually the truth. So now, um, I think I will just round up. I'm just watching the time, and I do know that um, the coordinator, the moderator, is also monitoring the time um, for this session to go to the next phase of Q&A. Thank you so much. I'll wait for your Q&A. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ovia. That was, um, you know, not wanting you uh, to finish. That was really uh, interesting. Um, a few nuggets that I took from your, um, from your speech uh, this morning um, that you had tagged, you know, um, building a brand through innovation. That brand itself is reputation and integrity. I think sometimes uh, we tend to, to forget that, that you don't just build a brand, uh, a brand um, from the scratch, but it's actually based on um, the reputation that you create and integrity. And you took us through uh, memory lane, you know, by mentioning um, some brands that didn't quite um, innovate and um, so went into um, oblivion, the famous um, Encyclopedia uh, Britannica. But you also now then um, reminded us of those brands that have stood uh, the test of time. And a particular one, uh, the very interesting one, is uh, Amazon, uh, which remarkably in this uh, period of the pandemic is not only doing well, but is actually uh, thriving. And um, you, you mentioned again uh, the Kodak, um, you know, that failed to, um, to innovate and got replaced by the uh, mobile phone uh, cameras. And, and then, of course, you reminded us um, that adversity actually teaches us to be innovative, um, which is where you mentioned uh, the, uh, the Flying uh, Doctor, uh, the Flying Doctor um, Initiative. And um, the survival now is not about um, the fittest, but it's actually a survival of the most uh, creative. Indeed, a very insightful uh, intervention from you this morning, Mr. Ovia. Uh, but before we go to the Q&A, I see that we already have um, questions coming in. I will encourage uh, participants to please put your questions in the Q&A. Before we proceed with the Q&A, we'll just take a minute um, to um, take a message from uh, our key sponsor this morning. Thank you. Thinking of banking in Africa, think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. A bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly, whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast, and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People. Technology. Service. Zenith Bank. In your best interest. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Yovia, if you will permit me, that is where I will uh, start from, because I noticed that um, in the course of your presentation, um, you didn't talk about um, Zenith Bank, which, um, as far as we know, is the largest bank in, um, in Nigeria. Um, how has your personal philosophy um, impacted the Zenith Bank branch, uh, brand? How has your personal philosophy impacted on the, on the brand Zenith Bank? All right, okay, thank you so much. And um, now the Zenit brand is a reputation or a vision we created 30 years ago. At that time, we all recall that Nigerians were very, very uh, doubtful as to whether young boys of our age at that time, we were all in our thirties, whether we could be really be trusted with some money, depositors money, whether we wouldn't wear just blue jeans and um, just um, vanish from, from the country. But we were determined to prove the public wrong. We're determined to make a difference, make a change. And it was actually a very scary moment. And you recall that it was during the military era. And I do know a number of uh, persons who were CEOs of banks at that time that were arrested, were jailed, were tried and jailed because um, they lost all their depositors money. They, they did. This. The history books are there of a number of banks, almost 120 banks existed in 1990. And today we have just only about 25 banks, and something went from somewhere. So we were really terrified 
And for that reason, we needed to be very, very careful and very honest. And we needed to show that we could be trusted. We have to display a great deal of honesty and integrity to be able to continue to do well. That was the vision there, and that was the focus. And in those days, if there was any letter from any government agencies or letters from regulatory bodies, whether it's bank, stock exchange, security commission, stop doing whatever you are doing. Just stop. You got to read those letters three times mm. to be sure you knew what they wanted you to do. Otherwise, if you ignored it, whatever the letter said might render the project we were running useless. So those are the error that we came into banking. Those were the era, those were the period, those were the situations. It was very scary. It was a great deal of adversity that made us to survive where we are today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Obey. Um, the second question I have is a follow-up onto that. <clears throat> so having now then um, established um, a brand, you know, uh, that has endured um, for so long, how do you ensure as the founder, you know, and um, I'm sure that uh, many members um, of the audience will be interested in this, how do you ensure that um, in the pursuit of expansion um, that you maintain the, the vision, that you maintain the brand? And again, more importantly, uh, when you have eventually retired, how do you ensure that that brand um, remains the way you have envisioned it? Okay, thank you. Uh, this one of my favorite um, topic or questions that I get asked that many times over and over again. What inspires me mostly is when you watch CNN top or um, 100 club, yeah, 100 club, companies, institutions that have lasted 100 and beyond. How did they do it? That's my inspiration that if those companies, those organizations have been built 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they are still surviving. We should be able to do that. Succession plan is very, very important. Succession plan. Who takes over from who? Very important. So far, we've done it three times now. We've done it so remarkably so well that the shareholder sometimes they don't even get to know when we make a change at the leadership. Many of them still assume I'm still there. You know, even if the last time I ever visited the office there, truly, it was like 10 years ago when I retired. They assumed Jimovia is still there. We meant that succeeding CEOs had always continued to run the institution even better than the way I was when I was a CEO. So definitely the brand will continue to be maintained. The reputation of the institution will continue to be maintained, whether I'm there, dead or alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question here, um, Mr. Ovia. Um, thank you for your insights. Um, is the banking industry going through the biggest innovation, disruptive change since the beginning of the, bank, of the banking um, industry as we know it? due to the rise of fintechs. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge to traditional retail banks in this disruptive uh, phase? I mean, you have spoken about innovation. Now, uh, fintech is upon us. Is that, um, to what extent is this a challenge to traditional banking as we have come to know it? Definitely, fintech is technology is very welcome. And I do not personally see it as being disruptive. I see it as being collaborative. Absolutely. I see it as um, um, a situation where we need the fintech to come along to do certain services that banks will not ordinarily be able to do. Definitely, you need the fintech. They are smaller, they are more nimble, they have the technology. Banks cannot start to invest in retail um, appliances, in retail tools, in retail technology. They cannot. FinTech has to do that. And the FinTech themselves could not possibly survive without the banks. 
because they need to offer the services to the banks and do some of those individual retail transactions like the on banks it's not possible for um, the wholesale banks the large banks to start operating opening account for the on bank in villages and all that you need the retail fintech company to do that it's a collaborative effort it's a cooperative effort so they are very very welcome we don't see it as being destructive. We see it as being creative, very innovative to our retail businesses. And at the end of the day, all the funding, all the liquidity is going to end up in banks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So it's to look at them as uh, collaborators rather than um, disrupting uh, banking as we know it. Um, we still have a lot of questions coming in. I would encourage you to keep your questions coming in. Uh, but before we proceed further, um, we do have um, a few sponsors uh, today, so permit us uh, to take a quick message from another one of our sponsors, Prudential uh, Zenith. Again, thank you to um, our sponsors. So I have another question here, uh, Mr. Ovia. Um, participant says, thank you very much for the insightful presentation. Uh, would you please share your personal template or methodology uh, that an organization can adopt um, to build a reputable brand leveraging um, innovation? Okay, thank you. First, you must have integrity. Integrity is defined as your word is your bond. Integrity is you must respect corporate governance. You must respect rule of law. You must recognize, respect contracts. You must honor contracts. Even though when those contracts were drafted, you suddenly realize it did not favor you anymore. You are going to lose money. You must honor it. Even if you are going to lose a lot of money, you must honor it. That's integrity. So that is what we do at Zenith Bank. And that's what we think people should do. Recognize, respect, integrity, rule of law, um, uh, and so on Perfect and so on. You must respect. Contact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question here, Mr. Ovia. Thank you very much for your insightful delivery. As it relates to Zenith Bank, uh, the success story of the bank, what challenges did the bank encounter in seeking to maintain its enormous brand equity? Um, how did you overcome these challenges in the light of the peculiar challenges um, of Nigeria and um, the pool to sometimes settle um, for less? Now, there will always be challenges in life. Mm -hmm. There will always be challenges in businesses. There will always be challenges in anything you do. It doesn't really matter the profession or the kind of business you run. There will always be challenges. You have to be prepared to face those challenges when they do come. 
That, that's what it is. And businesses may not be good all the time. You have to be prepared that when you run into such adversity, you'll be able to survive at the end of the day. But you can't run away. You must honor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the examples that you have given, the uh, Amazon, Apple, uh, great examples of successful innovative endeavors. Uh, these companies were supported by conducive environment with an abundance of infrastructure and capital and were able to scale rapidly. What tips do you have for innovators in Nigeria to overcome uh, the myriad of challenges that our environment, uh, the peculiarity of our environment uh, presents? Would you have any tips? Okay, let me put it this way. Every country, every nation, they all have their own peculiarities. It's not just in Africa or in Nigeria that many people we tend to complain that we don't have the type of enabling environment that Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, that they enjoy in the US. That is their own environment. We have our own. We have to adapt to our own situation and our own circumstances. And the kind of enabling environment that these companies, um, very creative, innovative com com companies enjoy in the US, you don't even see too many companies enjoy that in Europe either. Absolutely. So it's not only in Africa. I remember um, the Sarkozy, when Sarkozy was the prime minister of France, he said that the way the French workers protest all the time, there's no way they could build such great institutions as Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook. He said so. And I recall, this is because they're all been protesting I'm for one thing. So it meant the prime minister of France at that time, Sarkozy himself, was admitting to the fact that what the great innovative companies in the US uh, were doing, they couldn't possibly do that in France. Mm -hmm. So let's not complain that in Nigeria we do not have perfect enabling environment and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, let's adapt to a situation that we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. Valid, very valid point indeed. Uh, situations are not always uh, perfect. Um, so we have another question here. Um, it's a privilege to hear you share insights this morning um, on this remarkable journey, building a global brand. Uh, with benefit of hindsight, what, do you, what would you have done differently um, as such translating to advice to younger entrepreneurs? So are there, are there uh, mistakes or missteps that perhaps you know, with the benefit of hindsight you probably would have done those things uh, a little differently. As an individual in running Zenith Bank, mm -hmm. I tend to think depending on time and chance, depending on the opportunity that may have arisen at that point in time, is actually difficult to hypothesize of what to do differently if such problem never occurred. Mm -hmm. We have problems here, yeah, we face challenges, and those challenges, we're able to surmount those, those challenges and resolve them and move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, you're, you're openly passionate about um, youth empowerment. Um, I would like to ask, in your view, how well do you think the business community in general um, has done in this regard? We know um, the situation with, um, with um, youth in the country. Um, you know, how, how have we done as a business community in empowering uh, young ones? The youth are the future of any nation, definitely. We must empower the youth, we must encourage the youth, and we must sponsor the youth. If you don't, you will see that the, our youth will turn out to be those that would not have had the opportunity that all of us would have had. So we need to encourage them, we need to empower them uh, so that they will be able to do very well. Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so there's a question here. What is the impact of an environment on the brand? 
Um, so can the, can the business environment within which um, a business operates, can it impact on the brand? You've given um, some very good insights, useful insights about rule of, uh, obeying the rule of law, uh, maintaining appropriate corporate governance, instilling uh, discipline across the organization, succession planning. Uh, but is it possible for the environment within which a business operates to um, shape the, the way uh, the brand is perceived or to sort of affect uh, the brand equity in any way? Is it possible? Oh definitely. oh, definitely. The environment is in which you operate is part of the brand equity. And you will see that for us to operate in the global society, we are authorized to operate in London, in the UK. We are listed in London Stock Exchange. The perception uh, years before we got listed and licensed was that African or Nigerian businesses, they probably might not respect the rule of law or terms of corporate governance. We are proving that we do respect the rule of law. We are proving that we've been able to obey corporate governance and recognize corporate governance all over the world, wherever we had operated. We've operated there in the UK for over 12 years and we have never been sanctioned once in the UK. So we respect what the regulatory body, regulatory institutions there, what they say, because we know back home the perception of Europeans about Africans or about Nigerian businesses that, okay, well, let's watch them, let's watch them very well. We are not given benefit of doubt. We are pre presumed um, guilty until we prove ourselves to be innocent. So we start on that angle that we must do things in such a way that we won't bring shame to our country because the perception of Europeans that we do business with is that, let's see whether these Africans, whether they will behave uh, properly well. And we've proven that. And not just with this Senate, we still have about almost uh, half a dozen Nigerian banks operating in London, and they are doing extremely very well. And I'm also sure that none of them had also the sanction or betrayed the name of our country. So let me, let me ask the question in another way. So let's assume that you go into a country and um, you, know, you have this clear path that you, that you want to tow, you know, uh, that is um, germane to your brand and that has uh, stayed you uh, the course of time. And you go into a particular country and the um, environment, the business environment in that country is um, in quotes, you know, somewhat aggressive and that will require you um, doing certain things with that, which are alien, alien to, um, to your culture that you have built. Um, how, would you, how would you respond, you know, which is what, what at the beginning, um, you know, when I try to get an insight into that in the course of expansion, um, you know, you're bound to go into different uh, jurisdictions, different territories uh, that sometimes are not aligned totally uh, with um, the brand, the reputation that you have built over time. Um, how would you respond? It's very simple. Mm. If we go into some jurisdiction mm. and it, became, it becomes obvious that we won't be able to survive there except we do certain things mm. that are not consistent with mm. our culture, our reputation, our integrity, mm. we'll move out. We certainly will not do those businesses there. We just mm. simply will not. So we don't necessarily need to be everywhere. Mm, absolutely. And I guess that also relates to the kind of businesses that one will, uh, would uh, venture into, uh, regardless of jurisdiction. So even in Nigeria here, I'm sure there are certain businesses that you would not uh, venture into uh, because of the likelihood of them uh, negatively impact, impacting on your brand. Definitely, definitely. You got it right. Definitely. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question here. Um, in this COVID-19 era, with its attendant effects, what strategic model do your businesses um, adopt to drive public affairs and stakeholder engagement? Um, so the person has mentioned the various uh, businesses. Is there any approach that you have taken um, to engage with stakeholders um, reflective of um, the times and the seasons that we are in? 
definitely COVID-19 is a very, very difficult period for all businesses globally, all over the world. It's a global pandemic, it is. And there is no institution, no country will be able to probably say, yes, we have the magic one, we have the solution to COVID-19. The only solution to COVID-19 is when there's a vaccine. Okay. When it's available for everyone, we all then go back to our normal way of life. But so far, you don't have a vaccine. So far, you don't have a cure for it. So everyone is obeying, respecting Center for Disease Control, World Health Organization's uh, protocol. That's all we do. We can design our own. Um, I'll be very surprised if any company is going to design any strategy. Different from World Center for Disease Control as well as World Health Organization protocol advise us to do. And uh, we are being the presidential task force on COVID-19. There are some protocol they already had announced. It's like, like a law and we keep to that. And so far it's worked for us. And I would imagine it also worked for other organizations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like you, I'm also praying uh, that that vaccine is um, speedily uh, discovered and available, you know, because I, th I guess there are concerns around, you know, first of all, it being uh, discovered and then when will it be available uh, particularly to um, to the rest of the world. Um, so I have a question here, which um, is uh, so, sort of in reaction to um, your your delivery on innovation and how uh, it relates to um, those technologies that were overtaken by innovation. Um, don't you think that what is happening generally is that there are products-based uh, technologies whose deaths um, have come and they must be replaced by new products based on new technologies. This means that it does not matter how hard one tries, this disappearance will one day come to anyone's product. So is that possible? Is it that there's a life circle, you know, that at some point um, you've just reached the end <clears throat> of that, um, the lifespan of that technology and it will be replaced necessarily um, by another technology and would, in, in quotes, die um, nat a natural death. What's, what's your view, sir? It's a matter of time and chance. Mm. It's just a matter of time and chance. Mm. The company, the organization that develops such technology mm. that might be replaced in the next few years, it could possibly be the same organization to come up with a game changer, another technology to replace it. It doesn't necessarily need to be another organization, but it's just that um, successful companies sometimes they become so complacent and it then encourages those who were not too successful or newcomers, if you will, to come up with a new technology of making sure that they are able to change the game, the rules of the game. Disruption is about changing the rules of the game. Absolutely. So they, they come up with products that are very disruptive. I could recall in 1990 when we started our operations, the new generation banks at that time, we knew we need to be computerized. We need to computerize, pure and simple. We need to innovate. There's no other way. There was no way we could catch up with the larger financial institutions that I personally call them 800 pound gorillas. They were very big. There was no way. You have to innovate. You have to be very disruptive with your technology. That's what all the new generation banks did at that time. And the result is there for, for you to judge. That is probably what you are talking about. Change the game. Just a game changing episode. It has to be game changing. You've got to be very disruptive. Mm. Pure and simple. Would there be other disruptive efforts by other individuals in the future? Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's what change is all about. The only thing is change. You have to continue to change. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. So I guess leading on to that is how do you create um, an organization, you know, that encourages or uh, that throws up innovation? So it's good to, you know, um, we're all talking about innovation. We want to have, uh, create a brand that would endure, that will last. You know, how do you ensure that within the organization uh, that creativity thrives 
and that innovation then becomes um, possible. Having the right people, people, the best assets of any company are the people. You have to have the best people. Do not hire your brothers, your sisters, or your cousins just because you know them from your village. Those ones, they will not give you any idea that will be disruptive. They will not give you an idea that will be game changers. No, they will not. They will be so happy to be loyal to you, but definitely they will not be disruptive. They will not create any change, but they will be very loyal to you. They will, they will bow down for you every morning, and that's all you get. Mm -hmm. So get the best, get the best people, get the best people. I would say people, 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 people. Hence, our tripod stand is people, technology, service. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, of course, create the right um, atmosphere for the people um, to, to thrive. Uh, there's a question here, I mean, and I wouldn't have been surprised if it didn't come. Um, what should you say to those um, in emerging industries, and the person has given the example of mining, uh, that are finding it difficult to access funding uh, given the lack of understanding of the industry itself. So I guess um, the, the perspective is that uh, perhaps the lenders sometimes don't understand some of these industries, so they find it difficult to now then um, support with funding. What would be your um, advice? I mean, what, what are your thoughts there? The mining industry. Mining um, very, very profitable business all over the world. Hmm. South Africa, their economy was built on mining, gold mining. Hmm. And they, they've been mining for many, many years and they continue to. Definitely, definitely, um, when the right technology is there, if the individual has the right technology to mine, he will receive the necessary financial support from financial institutions. I don't see why not, because it's highly, very profitable. Many economies are built on the strength of mining industries. So it depends on the structure that they have. It depends on how they are also able to package their presentations and being able to present their proposals to financial institutions. That's what that matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I would just like to ask a lead on question. So in your view, you know, because a lot of entrepreneurs, you engage them and they, they use access to funding as uh, one of the reasons why they haven't done well um, in their business. What's your view in this regard? Is access to funding such a challenge um, to um, building, uh, building and enjoying business? To what extent is it um, a, a problem in your view? There's a number of factors. One, the type of business is set. Some businesses, you don't really require a huge amount of funding. Mm -hmm. All you need for some business is just some great ideas. You have angel investors. You have private equity investors. You have uh, venture capitalists. So um, that it is a brilliant idea. So it depends on what kind of business it is. Mm, absolutely. absolutely. Um, there, there are quite a few questions, but I think we're... Uh, running out of time. Somebody wants to know if you would please, uh, are you currently reading any book? And if so, um, do you want to share the details of that book with the audience? I read all kind of new ideas that have come up. Social media is there now. You read so much in magazines and um, so on and so forth. So Absolutely. the books that you want to read are books that will improve what you your current state of position, where you are, depends on where you are, if you are a student, how you can improve your academic performance, if you are an entrepreneur, how you can improve your businesses, if you're already a very highly successful entrepreneur, there are also things you can do. So it depends. There are no specific book that will appeal to all structure of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Sai. It's been uh, quite uh, a rewarding um, afternoon. I don't know if you have any passing words of your own uh, before I hand over um, to uh, Mr. Alan Davis for the vote of thanks. Do you have any passing words um, to um, the, the audience? Yes. First of all, uh, let me encourage all my peers there. Hence, I call this peer-to-peer -peer conversation. You recall at the beginning, it's peer-to-peer -peer conversation. I will encourage you to also send some ideas to me also. 
because I also like to improve from my current position to do quite many things better. And I have a foundation where I'm building schools and I build schools. I want to enlighten the school. I want to encourage the students and also empower the youth and enrich them the best way I can. So if there's anything you could do to encourage me in that regard, I would be very, very pleased. All I can say, stay home, stay safe, wash your hands regularly, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And I must say that um, we as of here, we're very proud of you. We're very proud of what uh, you have done um, with the brand and what you have done for Nigeria and, and for Africa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. And thank you for accepting uh, our invitation and sharing uh, your experience with us uh, this afternoon. But I'm not the one going to do the thanking. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Deputy President, Mr. Alan Davis. Alan? Thank you very much, uh, BC. Um, I think the um, um, president would like us to take a photograph. So I would ask you to leave your video on. I'm trying to get mine on at the moment. I think it's on, is it? Yes, so, um, so um, if the secretary could tell me when the photograph has been taken, then I can uh, make the vote of thanks. I'm sure it's been done by now. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank, obviously, our speaker, our speaker, Jimovia, who is an icon of the banking world. Uh, thank you, sir, for your inspiring presentation. I'm sure we all enjoyed it. I'd like to also thank the moderator, our Deputy President, Mrs. Bisi Adiemi, and, of course, our sponsors, uh, Zenith Bank, PLC, Prudential Zenith Life Insurance, XRM Ideas Limited, Cyberspace Limited, and Ernst & Young. I'd also like to thank our past presidents, patrons, and council members who've been present at this uh, presentation, and of course the attendees from, from all over the world. Um, um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Ovia, you missed out Europe. I happen to be in London at the moment, uh, but I'm sure there are many people from all over Europe, as well as other parts of the world. Finally, uh, I'd like to thank the um, chairman of the, the programs committee and also his committee for planning this webinar. I believe that we have another webinar later this year, later this week, should I say, of the Strategic and Inno Innovative Leadership for Business con con Continuity. This is on Wednesday the 29th and Thursday the 30th of July, and I'd encourage uh, everybody who's enjoyed this um, webinar to join the one that's upcoming uh, in the next few days. So thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for attending. <laughs>